Chazag Be'amate, welcome to the week of Parsha Kitisa. The Tehillim that corresponds to this week's Torah portion is Tehillim Ayin He, which corresponds to Tehillim 75. Kema Malot Le'Yisrael. So something of the essence of the ascension of Israel or to Israel. Keshish or Kesis. Lahem Yom Tov. Oh, we got a Yom Tov. We got something about a, a good day, a holiday. Uh, Enam Oskim. Something about maybe uh, Oset. I'm, I'm blanking on the word for Osek. What does it mean to be Osek? Uh, hold on a sec real quick because I feel like I should know this word. Osek. What is that word in Hebrew? Um, I need to consult my phone. I'm cheating. Yes, I'm cheating right now. Osek means like to engage. Hmm. Osek by mitzvah. And it has a connection to um, a mall, like to toil. So to be Osek in Torah is to make it your work. Okay. I couldn't let that one go. Sorry. I just, Osek is, is such a word for me. Bedivre um, ha holot, something about the words. And I feel like that's the root halel. And I'm looking, I'm going through these uh, Ivrit words right now. So I'm currently here. Halot. And rach. Is like only and uh, Beshirot songs, Ut Shabchot, and I think these are like the praises again, Halakot, um, the ways or the laws, Pesach, there's Pesach, there's Passover, yeah, I hope y'all are ready for Pesach, and Be Pesach, Vegam, Ke Shamru, um, Sheamru. Could be about speaking, because that's not really Shomer. Uh, that's Shayam, like Amar being the root. Nase uh, Benishma, we know that one. We will do when we will hear. Beze Kimu Ha'olam, something about eternity or the world or the hidden, because uh, Alem means to, to hide or conceal which is kind of um, interesting. But uh, U Musrim, I think that has the word Musar in it. So I see a little bit of Musar there. Uh, Gedolim, so something great. And then Leotam, could be like a letter or a marking or something like that from the word Ot, but to mark them or something like that oh oh i don't know uh hamit an angim i see the word oneg in there ainun gimel so something about a pleasure or something uh and pleasures but i could be wrong uh baolam shechashvu olam being this world shechashvu asher Kechom Ose Kol Ha Chayil. Workers of all power, or worker of all, maker of all power, or something that's all powerful. Let's see how we did, or how I did, I guess. Uh, how great is Israel? During their holidays, they do not engage in frivolity. So they don't engage in frivolity. Um, how great is Israel? Okay, ma, at like what or how? Okay, great, like alot, uh, the Israel, they do not engage in frivolity. Enam, oskim, bedivre, alot, ra, so they don't engage in frivolity. So we were talking, uh, I believe it was last week or the week before, about daber, daber, which is in the, um, the, let me go ahead and stop this real quick because I want to pull this up out of the 
Sidur. Uh, this is part of the prayers that we recite on um, Shabbat in the Kiddush for the Shabbat day. Page 248 is where it starts. We talk about like not speaking mundane things, right? So, yes. Okay, it's page 248. So let me go back over here. Ready, share, phone, and we're back, everybody. Okay, so if you look at this Kiddush for Shabbat day, this part right here, um, if you refrain right there, so this whole section, refraining from pursuing your affairs, I think my tablet froze. Don't freeze. Don't freeze. What's happening? What's, what's it doing? Okay, but anyway, that, that whole line in the Ibrit, it's like a Ibrit, it uses Vedaber Davar. So remember these words, pun intended are the word for uh, word, but it can also mean things. It could also mean matters. And while we're on this point, the word ta'am, like to taste or ta'amin ta or like taste, those are also the words for the uh, cantillation marks. And the ta'amin the ta are also known as halakhic matters. So there's a, a, a a midrash or a Talmud portion that talks about Rabbi Akiva, who will be able to expound halakot from the uh, the markings and the crowns of the Torah, like the nekudot, not necessarily not necessarily the cantillation marks. But I think it's interesting that even with the cantillation marks, it speaks to the fact or seems to the fact that there are halakhic matters that are taking place here. So when we're looking at Devar. It's also halakhic uh, in nature and like conduct and things like that. So as we're looking at this, I think it's interesting because uh, it uses the divre halot or holot, holelot. So we're not engaging in frivolous things. When you think about all of the Hallmark holidays that are out there, What's interesting is a lot of them are to break your bank, so to speak. And then a lot of them are self-gratifying. There are many who love to post about it, um, that a lot of the holidays that are not in the Tanakh or in the Torah are uh, idolatrous. And they usually have to do with, uh, what do they call those rituals? Uh, fertility rituals. And uh, it's all about self-gratification and things like that. Well, if you look at all of the Yom Tovim that we celebrate as Yisrael, we do not have such things as the main hallmarks of, you know, our Yom Tovim. And this is one of the praises, actually, that Hashem gives to Israel. Uh, and it's actually in the Midrash says, and I believe it's in Bami Bar. And numbers. So the volume of the Midrash says where it goes into the talking about so you got, it goes into talking about the uh, Yom Tovim uh, in numbers, which is Parsha Pencus, the, the Torah portion of Pencus actually breaks down the Yom Tovim. In that section of the Midrash, it talks about the uh, the praise of Israel. If it's not that section, it would be the section of Parsha, what is that, Amor, uh, in Vayikra, where it goes into uh, talking about the Yom Tovs as Hashem has prescribed in the Torah. But all being said, when you look at the way that we're to observe the Yom Tovim, the goal is not to be all crazy and to be all fleshly, to be all like throw yourself into uh, carnal shenanigans. Uh, basically, just like this says here, not engaging in frivolity. 
And this is really important because Purim is right around the corner. And we're in the month of the first Adar already. The second Adar is coming up. Uh, and as we're in this time, we should be elevating our joy and increasing with joy, like with anything that we're doing. And so we want to make sure that we're not uh, overdoing it and pushing ourselves into uh, territory we don't want to be in of when it comes to frivolity. So uh, when you think about the fact of the halakha of getting so drunk that you can't tell the difference between um, Haman and Mordecai, well, that doesn't necessarily mean drink too much wine. It doesn't mean like, you know, get sloshed and all those kinds of things. Even at Pesach, because we have four straight cups. I mean, they're spread out throughout the night, but that's a lot of wine you know, that you're drinking during the Seder, and it's two nights in a row in the in the exile, in the diaspora, that is, well, I know even if you're in the land, you're in exile, but all to say, if you're outside the land of Israel, two back-to-back -back nights, that's eight cups of wine in less than 24 hours or 48 hours. So uh, being really, really careful because we had two Shabbat, that's wine and grape juice and then Purim's coming up that's wine or grape juice and then Pesach is coming up that's wine and grape juice and it's just like does it ever end and the answer is no because you keep drinking every Shabbat you're supposed to have um, cups at night and cups during the day there's actually a custom I don't know where from but to actually drink four cups of wine on the night of Shabbat uh, so after your kiddish and during your meal to consume at least four cups of wine. So I've tried to do that as I remember it, and I just want to hand it over to you now. So not engaging in frivolity, but in song and praise, which I love that Be'er wrote. Uh-oh. Be'er wrote, U'tishbachot, Be'tishbachot. So songs and praises. Um... And the Torah, or in the study of the holidays laws. So Halakot was in there. Look at that. You have the Halakot Pesach Be Pesach Be Gum. Uh, so it's interesting what it's using uh, as laws because it's saying the holidays laws and it's using the Pesach Pesach. Interesting. And then it says, also when they proclaimed at the giving of the Torah, we will do and we will hear. Proclamation. So, vegam, like an also. And this is why when we say gam lecha, and you as well. So when someone goes, shavuto, you can be like, gam lecha, like you as well. So I can say, uh, shabbat shalom, gam lecha. Actually, we, we want to try to return the shalom, so that's why we want to uh, close the loop. Someone sends out Shalom. You want to make sure you reciprocate it back if you're up to that. Um, and if someone gives you a bracha, like Mazal Tov, or, um, you know, Yasimka Elohim Ve'afrayim Ve'kim Nasha, or Ke'afrayim Ve'kim Nasha, you know, you can be like, Gam Lecha, you know, talking to another man. Um, but anyway, like, Gam like is also, and then uh, lecha is like to you. And then, um, you know, in Spanish, it's eguamente, which I probably butchered the pronunciation, but eguamente is what I'm trying to say. Likewise, uh, ditto, if you're a speaker of that kind of jive, or, uh, or as we say in the hood, back at you, bro. Please, you know, anyway, uh, you be easy, be up, big up, those kinds of things. Anyway, uh, all that being said, Vegam Shamru, not seven Ishma. And then uh, that's when we said we were doing, we were here. They allowed the world to remain in existence. So that's what that Beze Kimu Haolam, like in this world, being in existence. Mm. This psalm 
also admonishes those who indulge in worldly pleasures and attribute their prosperity to their own efforts. Mm. Admonishing those who indulge in worldly pleasures and attribute their prosperity to their own efforts. Okay. Um, Musarin. Yep, there you go. Those uh, fancy... Uh, rich people, powerful people who are taking pleasure in worldly things and in their own works and power, you know, so you can actually kind of see that here in the verse. So, Sheikh uh, Hashvu, like um, thinking themselves, the word Hashav meaning to think, uh, using your mental faculty, Asher uh, Kakam Ase. Which is interesting how that's translated, um, attributing their prosperity to their own efforts. So like them thinking like, yes, I have this ability, this capability to make this happen and to bring this forth and to put myself in a good place. I went to school, I went to college, got this, we got this in the bag and well qualified. And it's just like, okay, let's just be a little careful. So there's some admonishment going on. All right. Fun with Hebrew. This is great. Okay. For the conductor, a plea not to be destroyed. A song by Asaf, a song. We we gave thanks to you, O oh God. We gave thanks. To, we gave thanks, and your name was near when they told of your wonders. When I choose the appointed time, I will judge with fairness. When the earth and all its inhabitants were melting, I established its pillars forever. I said to the perverse, do not pervert Israel. And to the wicked, do not raise your pride. Do not raise your pride heavenward, nor speak with an arrogant neck. Which, by the way, is a reference to Paro, who has a, a back of the neck kind of thing. Something going on with the neck. Uh, and then for... The word for uh, neck being ORF, and those are the letters in the name Paro. Uh, for not from the east or from or the west, nor from the desert, does greatness come. Not from the east or from the west, nor from the desert, does greatness come. For God is judge. He humbles one and elevates the other. For there is a cup of punishment in the hand of Hashem. With strong wine full of mixture, he pours from this. And all the wicked of the earth will drink, draining its dregs. But as for me, I will tell of it forever. I will sing to the God of Yaakov. I will cut off all glory of the wicked. But the glory of the righteous will be raised up. This is interesting in light of what actually occurs in this Torah portion because there is the golden calf and we had the festivity and the frivolity that centered around idolatry. The festivity and the frivolity that that what around idolatry? That that uh, consisted around idolatry. I'm just thinking of a, a rap line that actually sounds really interesting. Frivolity uh and the yeah the frivolity the idolatry and all that was going on there so anyway um wow i'm just thinking of the fact that all these things that occurred in this week's story portion and in this psalm we're talking about the cup of punishment the dregs and uh moshe rabbeinu grounded up the calf and made us drink it and it's those who are guilty, their stomachs swelled, and the Leviim, uh, you know, took swords, and three thousand, um, you know, lost their life. And one of the things to always remember about this, because there's like this whole connection to the three thousand uh, who were added to the community in Acts chapter two, and seemingly being a rectification for the golden calf because these events took place during the same time on the calendar 
and we know that the Kedusha of the original event always occurs. So every time we get to Shavuot, the same thing that happened at the original moment of Shavuot is present and available now. And this is the whole thing with understanding alignment with the dimensions. Time goes in this spiral, right? It's in this circular, circular, cyclical uh, type thing. But as you go through the year, that circle is supposed to go up, up, up. And it talks about it being like a Fibonacci spiral, like the way the shofar looks. If you would stand it up, time should be like that. So every point that you come around on Shavuot or any of the other Yom Tov should be on a higher plane. But you can draw a line back to the original. This is why you can kind of like remember, I remember the first time I celebrated Shavuot. I remember the first time I learned about it, you know, and where you are now, it's actually a cool practice to kind of connect back to that but even more so to connect back to the original moment of Shavuot which is where apparently all of our souls who received the Torah stood like all who had come to Torah stood at Mount Sinai and you know we're kind of connecting back to ourselves, you know at that point when we're celebrating Shavuot going back to oh, I remember when when Hashem Came down on the mountain, the mountain was floating in the air, there was smoke, there was clouds, there was lightning, there was chauffeur rope. You know, like, I remember that. That's somewhere hidden in us. Which, by the way, there is actual understanding that um, the DNA can contain historical information from previous uh, centuries and uh, throughout human history. Like, that is concealed somewhere chemically in the human body. We're capable of actually storing about, uh, what was it, like 13.5 million or billion years worth of information of data in us. And this is why sometimes things can be like a deja vu or you can feel like, man, I know this. Like, it's a weird far out thing. But like, what's interesting is we talk about like the whole like mixing uh, human DNA with like technology, microchips, Neuralink and all that kind of stuff. Um, but your body does work like an organic computer, like it stores data. And we don't ever really talk about it like that, but you know, your body programs itself. Like if you want to be sick, your body will be like, oh, we want to be sick. So what do we want to start shutting down? We want to shut down arms, nerves, you know, you want to get old, then you want to start slowing up and being all stagnant. Your body will start figuring out ways to do that. If you want to be happy, you want to be joyous, you want to be energetic, your body will be like, okay, well, I'm going to need some things, you know, and you'll start having cravings for things that you don't normally crave because your body's like, this is what I need to get healthy, to get that energy you want, you know, um, and oxygen therapies and things like that. And that reprograms, you know, blood cells and nerve endings and your brain is like a supercomputer. I don't know. I think many of us have heard that like a quantum computer is like the brain because your brain can like literally rework itself. One of the cool practices of neuroplasticity is to practice for a week brushing your teeth with your opposite hand. It will be awkward when you start, but by the end of the week, you're going to start to feel more comfortable with it. And that, that, has created new synapses in your brain. And this is like the rewiring process that you can do, which is one of the interesting things about people who are Baal Shubas and you haven't grown up in Torah. And, and if you're in any of those categories or if you're on any of those spectrums, this is actually what you're doing to your neshama. You're like rewiring your neshama because every person is actually taught the Torah before they're born. And then we have an oath. Our souls are given an oath that says, be a zadik, be a righteous person, which is if you study the Tanya, it brings down that a person who is a zadik is a person who would have more merits than averot, like sins or, or demerits, if you will. And so it's not necessarily about being sinless. That's not what a zadik is, because if you look at Proverbs, it says a righteous person which is a Zadik falls seven times. And then it also talks about that um, the Zadik is known as the foundation of the world. And the world 
sometimes is built on these pillars, uh, depending on who you ask, like what source you consult. Uh, I believe the world has seven pillars hewn out. Let me see. Uh, consulting my pocket computer as Rabbi Kotz, may he live and be well, talks about the world, seven pillars, which I think is interesting because if this is the case, if the world does have seven pillars, I know there is, the only one I know is the, uh, the 12th. And, um, uh, yeah. So apparently it says the seven pillars of the world, which are Adam, Hanok, Enoch, Noach, Abraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov, and Moshe. Uh, seven pillars, fear of Hashem, instruction, knowledge, understanding, discretion, counsel, and reproof. Now, isn't that interesting? Apparently seven righteous men. Uh, seven aspects of wisdom and a zadik can fall seven times. Mm. Just very, very interesting. Uh, I, I did not think about this until, you know, us getting into this conversation right now. But all that being said is the, the fact of, you know, being righteous, keeping the Torah, connecting back to your original self. And, um, if you go to the Musar class from last week, I know it's I know it's not really Leia, but Leia may she live and be well is being such a beautiful vessel and bringing down just like ferocious truth, which her Avenger being Gamora, obviously that makes sense, but oh my gosh, and um, the the class last week we discovered or we read the insight that sin is basically basically you forgetting your identity so that when you're making teshuva you're reconnecting to your true self so when we talk about repenting from sin and not sinning or when we sin we fall short of the mark it's actually us being like people who have experienced identity theft like we're stealing our true identity. We're we're taking away from the glory of Hashem. We're diminishing Hashem's glory because His glory is manifest in us. And so, you know, keeping true to our identity, allowing Hashem's glory to take its place in the world. You know, again, I mentioned last time about like the world being dark is because the light is where the dark, the or the darkness is where the light is. And we got to get the darkness out by getting out of darkness, uncovering Hashem's glory in us that has been diminished by us forgetting who we are. And as souls with a body, your soul are, is coming from a higher plane. It's a higher dimension. And it's coming all the way down through what we, Bezrat Hashem, will get into just a minute called the four worlds. And those are different layers that are like uh, lenses that you can put on a uh, beam of light and uh, it'll either sharpen the focus or dull the focus. This is how we can seemingly live in this creation and think there is no God because it's like where we live is like so diminished in Hashem's glory that it's kind of like, is there even a God? Like God can hide himself so much that it seemingly as if he isn't existing, which is crazy because he is existing and his glory and his presence is so powerful and palpable here, but you got to tune in. And right now you have to reach into higher dimensions to tune into that and get more expanded in that. But the call and the mission is to bring that here, which is why we need to build a temple, which is why we should be temples because we're touch points of Hashem's Shekinah in the world. You realize the Shekinah of Hashem used to walk around this earth with us, as opposed to just having to be in the in the Mishkan or having to just be in the Mikdash or just be in Israel, or just be in Jerusalem. Like it was everywhere and it's going to happen again. And one of the things is, is that we play a part in that. And so making sure that we pull all that out extract from that darkness so um there are many practices out there right now talking about give yourself 
that you're hiding in dark places or the nooks and crannies of yourself, the uh, undesirable traits of yourself, give love to it. Think of it like the orphan child who uh, desperately needs a family and you're like, I don't know, for some reason, I just want to bring this child into my home and give it love. And the child is very unsure. It's been in the orphanage system for how long? And it's kind of like, I give up on people. I have no hope in humanity. I'm just going to take care of myself. Da, 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 da. Narrative goes on, right? So you bring that child into a loving, structured home. And obviously, what's one of the first things that's going to happen? No, I hate you. Da, 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 da. Like negative energy, just overload. Let Let the wrong circumstance happen. Because, you, you know, you're still trying to get to know each other. They're trying to get to know you. You're trying to get to know them. You know, when you don't know what pushes people's buttons, what turns people off, what makes people mad and irate. And you start hitting all those switches and buttons and landmines and, oh, my, you know, and it blows up. And then the rectification process, which is a lot of, I guess I can just go to it now because I'm really talking about this Shvirata Kaleen Shattered Vessels. I'll put this on the screen so you can see it, uh, even though I know it's limited information. But just so you know, this is what I'm talking about because um, when, when you go from the aspect of like everything blows up and goes all over the place, like there's a gathering what you can back together and then there's the healing and the rectifying it, like making it better, making it stronger, like that pottery that you can like shatter, but put it back together with the gold. There's like a gold bond glue type adhesion uh, that will actually make the shattered pottery stronger. And that's kind of what we're looking at with the worlds. So Shattering of the Vessels, World of Tohu. And again, these are all coming from uh, Chabad. So I'm giving you the author so you can look them up. Uh, Rabbi Moshe Miller uh, is the are these two. And then uh, over here, and again, these are in the notes. So you'll be able to take more time to look at it. Yisrael Coulter, uh, which I believe is a rabbi as well. Chabad is full of rabbi'in. They do have that home study program that I mentioned about and other uh, seminaries that people can go through. The typical practice is definitely to uh, send the children to uh, school so that um, between the men and the women and what the role should be uh, to specialize in the training and give them the opportunity to go to Israel for like a year or two or maybe more, um, complete uh, all of the education that needs to happen so that the seminary can occur and then you go through the Smika program and all that. There's Yeshiva University. There's uh, other places you can go. Uh, copious amounts of Rebbeim that have the ability to extend Smika to their students when that Rebbe feels that that person is worthy and ready. So there's all these things. So just these individuals, sometimes when you click on their names, you find out that, oh, they're just, you know, like a, a layman teacher or an author or they're an artist, you know, and then you'll find out, oh, they're also a rabbi and, you know, all these kinds of things. So anyway, this is the process I'm speaking to right now of the, uh, the healing because it says... During the act of creation, a residue of lights of Tohu remained attached to the shattered vessels of Tohu. So there was a higher world that existed before we're, what we're in now. So this is the world of Tikkun, which is the world of repair. The higher world is called Olam HaTohu, and which is like, there are no vessels up there. It's just pure light everywhere. That exists right now, but it's covered in darkness. And so... What the Rebbe, the Lubavitcher Rebbe actually brought down is that we need to take those lights and put them in vessels. And that will bring the Messianic era into the full front, like where we're trying to go to get out of exile. So this whole thing about the world of Tohu, this is your, your people who are seemingly uncouth, but they want to study Kabbalah. They're um, doing all sorts of crazy things, but yet, you know, they're super loving kindness and chesed and 
Uh, you know, they have the proper amount of Gibura to put up boundaries where boundaries need to be, you know, uh, wells of wisdom and light and truth, but yet they're doing something else that is, I don't know, like they're in a, uh, the, the analogy I'll give is like they're in a back alley, but they're selling like valuable, precious jewels, which why would you sell those kinds of things in a back alley? But that's what like the likes of Tohu are, is they're in this very, Uh, unstructured place and they got all this light but they don't have a vessel and that's what judaism really is about is putting all the light into a vessel and that process seemingly is uh suffocating to an individual who is used to the expansive light and the glitter and the fireworks that when you have to bring that giant sparking flame down into that little blue flame You're kind of like, man, I used to be so much more on fire for the Lord. I used to be swinging from the rooftops and all the loud music and da-da-da-da-da. And I was actually talking about the still small voice last week. And I was like, you know, what's interesting is Hashem has the still small voice, but yet we want to make everything loud. And it's really hard to hear someone if you're being really loud. And sometimes you have to turn the volume down on life. on circumstances so that you can hear Hashem. And when you bring all this light into a vessel, you have to bring down all the glitz and the glam and bring it into a, a channeled, structured, con uh, consistent container. And like you move, like, so instead of like dressing all in modesty, you know, and I made the, the uh, statement about what's in the halakha about don't call a person up who's uh, sleeveless, and wearing shorts. They're not allowed to make Aliyah to the Bima. That's actually how I showed up to Shul for the very first time. It was a Shabbat. I had a uh, diamond earring in my ear, and um, I had my hair all like fro curly out, like all picked out and everything, and then I had this green basketball jersey with jean shorts and like these high top Nike type shoes, You know, with the ankle socks, because, you know, you don't wear you know, certain type of socks you got to wear if you're going to be dressing like that. You know, so anyway, I showed up to shul as a person that is invalid to make Aliyah. Like, and then I learned, oh, yeah, you need to cover up, cover up your arms, cover up your legs, you know, like dress appropriately. You don't look like you're trying to play street ball, you know, and all these kinds of things. And so uh, it's just really interesting that. That seemingly felt freeing. Oh, and don't forget the silver necklace. Can't forget the bling bling going on up in there. So I had all that, you know, and I thought I was it, you know, and it's just kind of like, yeah, we dress, you know, there's custom to dress black and white. The the fancy hats that you can wear, um, the suits, you know, the button ups and things like that. You would think, oh, why would you try to? be all stuffy in your dress or whatever, you know, and obviously there's a bunch of ways you can be modest, but like still look cool. Like that's a thing. Mo cool modesty is a thing. So if, if you're worried about becoming too modest and losing your coolness, there's totally an avenue for that. And this is why I think Jewish fashion shows should be a thing. I'm just going to throw that out there. Obviously being a rapper, a dancer and um, loving to be a part of the entertainment in the kosherest way possible, um, that would be something I would love to see, maybe something I should probably do and, and work out. Uh, one of our bat mitzvahs that actually Mazel, when she lived in Be Well, got to actually uh, teach and train. Her Torah portion was Parashat Tadzave, and she said, you know what I want my, my Tikkun Olam project to be? I want to do a, a fashion show. And she got all the women in the shul together and they did this whole thing with tackles and uh, modest dress and all this kind of stuff. And it was just for the women. And they had a fashion show and they talked about how to do their makeup. Obviously not on Yom Kippur, you know, but talked about all the times and the ways you could do your makeup and your accessorizing while still being modest. Because for women, the things that have the most glory, being able to cover that up and not depend on your quote-unquote goodies uh, for your worth and your value, the fact that a woman can do that is very, very powerful thing 
and it creates huge uh, radiations of God's glory throughout the cosmos. It's like supernova type stuff. But yet, if you're a person who walks around with that, or if you're in a community where you see women like that, you think, oh, yeah, you know, they're dressing as a new Baruch Hashem, that's cool, you know, this is the, you know, status quo, this is how we roll, da 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 da, -da. but on a spiritual level, if you could actually see what's going on in that dimension, it is like, whoosh, like nuclear bombs going off, like ridiculous levels. Because when a person wants to put light into a vessel and they hold that and they, um, they keep it consistent and it's over time, it's for the long haul. It's not just a phase. It's not a fad. You know, it's not something that they're bitter about. You know, there's all the intention there. There's all the making sure the due diligence of doing it the appropriate way and becoming more mature and educated on these things. Like when you're doing things like that, like for the fact of me, you know, dressing as a new as opposed to dressing like I told you about, you know, like these are doing huge things, especially when you're eating kosher. You know, if you come from eating triple bacon cheeseburgers and dip in calamari and cocktail sauce and shrimp cocktails and, you know, doing all that stuff and just um, having ice cream right after you eat your burger, that's like bluebell ice cream, you know, like when you're doing all those things and you go, oh, my gosh, I going, I'm going to go kosher, you know, and you start kosher rooting your kitchen, kosher rooting your dishes, changing your meal plans and, you know. No longer eating those things. Those are bringing in light into vessels. And people who are who are willing to accept upon themselves the yoke of the Torah, there is a bug flying around. What is going on? Um, those who are willing to take up on that yoke, the more that they're honing in their observance, they're getting educated on these things. This is why, again, I'm going through this home study program on the laws of Torah and as well as the other 35 books, but right as Shem helped me, um, these are things that are bringing down that light. And the more we can do that, we, we will fill this world with light, but the light has to be in vessels because in the world of repair, which is tikkun or rectification, when you put the light into the vessel, that will increase the overall light that's here and dispel the darkness. Because again, like we're saying, most of the light is concealed in the darkness. And that's really how darkness exists. It feeds off of the light. So therefore, if you're able to take away its food source, and now you can not only dissipate the darkness, but you can also increase the light. On top of all of this, so there's a, a process known as, I'm not really seeing it here. Where is the word brewer? Um, I guess I did not save it, but there is a word known as um, gathering the sparks, and then a world of uh, a word that talks about rectifying the sparks. Um, okay, I'm going to stop real quick, and I'm going to um, go over here and pull this up. I got to go to the website and get it. I got to go get it, man. So, how's everybody doing? Talk amongst yourself. Any new things you learned lately that you think is really cool? Um, I don't remember how I searched and found this. If you search really hard, you will find what you're looking for. The article is called, Where Are All the Worlds? So, yeah, I guess I'll just go ahead and do this right now. Okay, back in the game. Okay. This is the website. And it says, Where Are All the Worlds? Because the cool thing is, everything is here. So instead of seeing it as like um, Atzilut, Beriah, Yetzirah, Asiyah, like as this stair step thing down or 
like a circle and then the circle kind of goes into the next one, like the, the old school Venn diagram, which is sideways. And it's like the overlapping circles. But if you would turn that up like this, you would think that's how the four worlds are like coming down, but they're actually all inside of each other. And they're like an onion, you know, like an ogre, they got layers. But this is the whole thing about like when you start tuning in, you hone in. That's why I talk about hone in, zone out, new headlines. What they talk about? We on beat. We got to dance and shout. And like an autobot, roll out. We on our jobs like a Mac computer, manifest a world of peace on the ones and twos. You know, like that. Because you got to do that when you like get your focus and your clarity there, you start doing this. And so I think it's, it gives you an analogy. It says, if you're picturing galaxies many light years away, think again. These are not worlds to be reached through space or travel or observed with a Hubble telescope. They're actually right here. Give you an analogy. Ever get your eyes checked? Remember having to look through two different lenses, being asked which one is clearer, one or two. Uh, and then he gives a little antidote there about himself. When I try to relate to these worlds, I picture them as another lens through which we can view reality. The higher the world, the sharper and the clearer the folk, the, the sharper and clearer the lens. So that everything in that world is an harmonious expression of God's simple oneness. This is why the higher you go in the worlds, everything becomes one. There's no denying the oneness of Hashem the higher you go. Which is, if you think about the Shema, it's really saying, I want to make the highest truth revealed. You know, and we do that closing our eyes and then covering our eyes. And we do that twice a day at least, if not more. You know, and so it's this really powerful thing where we're really manifesting the highest world or the deepest, most innermost place into the outer, external, lowest of the worlds. And that word that I'm looking for is not here. Where is it? It's the word Berur. I think I have to type in Shpilat Hakeim. Hakeim. Sleepa. Revirat. There. Oh, there it is. I saw it. Go back. Go back. Turn the car around. This. So these words. Berur. That's the gathering. Tikkun, that's the re rectification, the parent, repairing. So we've passed the point of berur, like extracting and going out and getting the light out of the darkness and all that kind of stuff. We're now in the rectification process, which I want to speak to this because this is what the Lubavitcher Rebbe was talking about. Like, if you open your eyes, Mashiach is here. Welcome to the Messianic era. And he said that almost 40 years ago. And uh, over Shabbat, we were discussing that if you're doing uh, diving, deep sea diving, where you have to use mixed gases because the pressure and the uh, overwhelmingness of being at such a depth, if you're breathing pure oxygen, you would explode kind of thing. And so you have to mix gases. And then as you're bringing a person back up to the surface, there's a reacclimation process to bring them back to that place. And where we're going to get out of exile is like coming back up from such a depth. You know, if you think about it, we talk about being fallen. Uh, we're in the lowest levels of impurity, the 50 gates, you know, and uh, all those kinds of things. Right. So it's like we're, as we're coming back up, we're elevating, we're, uh, you know, uh, rising back to the surface, if you will. We're going back to where we used to be and then we're going to go even higher. That when you're bringing that person back up, you have to purify all the air and all these things, and you have to bring them up slowly, and it could take up to like a month to bring the person back up. And there's sending food down, you know, deep, deep compressor, deep pressurizing, 
you know, chambers and opening doors, closing doors, making it's a mixed gas diving thing. So just look up mixed gas diving, talk to people who know about it. Um, the ind the individuals I was speaking with over uh, Shabbat about, we were just doing this very uh, allegorical and uh, metaphorical study on the the Torah and learning, and it was it was just so cool. It was amazing. Um, which, by the way, it was during it was after Oneg, which Oneg is delight, and I want to encourage everyone if you don't feel delight during your own egg start getting into it man find what you really love and like connect that to the tour you know i love music so I, I have to talk about that you know and i love the superheroes so understanding the superheroes from a jewish perspective and being able to be like okay so this is how the hulk is like a hasi you know and they actually have an image of the hulk wearing um zizi like a, a talit katan, like a the one you put under your shirt. Then he had a little payo and he had a little hat. It was interesting. It was so amazing. But anyway, uh, those kinds of things, and you need to find delight in that and like really expand that and, and like make that super contagious. But anyway, all that being said, this is where we are. We're in the process of the tikkun. Like the clarification has happened. Now we just got to tikkun everything. This is the restoration process. Then it says, when the sparks of holiness are extracted from the pot and are rebuilt into the vessels of Tikkun. This, again, putting the light in the vessels, you know, and uh, Tikkun, 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 can't say it enough. And so this is why one of the things that Bezrat Hashem, you know, I've really taken up on myself to do is to do the Tikkun through the music and the dance. There is so much like um, drugs, and sex and self-gratification going on with rap and like talking about me, 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 you know, and all these kinds of things and all the dance world. There's all the shaking of body parts in the world going on, but to be able to get all of that stuff and pull it into the realm of holiness. You ever seen a Jewish wedding? Like when they dance in the circles and with the chair, which, by the way, if you go in a counterclockwise circle, you bring down what is known as or uh, which or just so I can get this right, because there's two types. And I want to get the right one, not my leak, my key. Probably misspelling it, but yeah. It's uh, outer. Uh, like an external. So my keef is so bad. Like this is the uh, this is goes to this. This goes to this. Male is like to feel, and like that's the inner panini, right there. Not panini. Like a sandwich, but like Panimi. Uh, Eitan Katz, May You Live and Be Well, actually has a song called Panimi is Yid. Like, I want to be a Panimi is Yid. I want to, like, my inside, I want the core of my being to be like Hashem, you know, like the Ivri Anoke, the Et Hashem, okay, Hashemayim, the Daret, you know, uh, from Benny Friedman, that song, Ivri Anoke, the Et Hashem, okay, Hashemayim, that's all. Uh, Panemius, you want that on the inside. Like, I can scream about it, dance about it on the external, but if my inside ain't dancing like that, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like, Aton Koch was like, I want my inside like that. You know, I want the, uh, I want the <laughs> Kiddushim on the inside, uh, and I want the esteem on the outside. <sighs> terrible okay anyway uh it's an inside joke about a rap which is funny because it talks about like cream on the inside something on the outside like uh, a car like talking about how like you want to have your your interior all like decked out and then on the outside you want to have it all blinged out you know and so um 
the song is called Ice Cream Paint Job. For anybody who wants to look it up, I know it's vulgar, terrible lyrics, but that's what I was laughing about because this is really what we need to be. This is what we need to be on. Like this. We need to be on my Keith Panini. So Bev Mimale, not ice cream paint job stuff. Like, so anyway, that's one of the things you can do to actually bring it to Coon is like, bring all that stuff in. Like that is some good energy. Like, yeah, bragging about your insides and bragging about your outsides. Okay, well, let's put that bragging in the right place then, you know? And while we're on it, this is a little crazy, but you know how there is the ramp that goes up to the outer altar in the uh, the Mishkan and the Mikdash, right? So Hashem says, don't put steps going up to my outer altar, like my sacrificial altar. You need to be modest. I don't want my Kohen going up like that. But yet, on the inside of the Mishkan and the Mikdash, there's a menorah that has steps in front of it. And the Cohen goes up steps to light the menorah. And it's like, oh, whoa, whoa, what happened to the modesty? It's like, no, we inside now. We ain't out in a public place. And the first thing I think about is things that should be done behind doors. And I'm going to be specific about this, that, you know, intimacy between the husband and the wife, not intimacy between strangers and people you just met and people you don't plan to, you know, uh, connect with like that. Um, and maybe it's the same sex and all that kind of stuff. Like all that stuff seemingly is done outside in the public. It's in the tabloids. It's in our face. It's in our movies, not in our movies, but you know, those kinds of things. And people do all these things and that stuff should be reserved for the husband and the wife behind doors. You know, and it's just like, take that wild, brazen energy and put that into its proper vessel, that kind of stuff, you know, and it's like, it's on so many levels, you know, all these cooking shows. Could you imagine if there was a cooking show that would teach you how to cook kosher food to the, to the level of challenges and competitions like Chef Emerald does and uh, Gordon Ramsay, you know, turn it into um, what? Gad uh, Ruvain, you know, Chef Gad Ruvain up in the house, you know, he gonna be real with it, you know, real with it, straight off the grill with it. You got to deal with it. Say your bracca to get it, you know, something like that. I, like, you, you see this like all across the board, you can do this, you know, like this would be so amazing. You know, competitions about um, how to cost root your kitchen the best. You know, obviously people like playing with fire, the, the, the pyrotech, pyromaniacs, where y'all all that, raise your hand. When you're getting ready to cost root your oven, you got to take the blowtorch to it. I mean, you don't have to. There's other ways you can do it, but that would be fun for people to go around. Man, I'm so ready to blowtorch your oven, you know, and it's just like people make uh, challenges, scavenger hunts, like Go find this, blowtorch that, you know, go find this and go dip that in scalding hot water, you know, go toggle these dishes, you know, go find, you know, all the, the hummets and get it out of here by the certain time because it's almost, you know, anyway, the, the game uh, show mind is coming out, I grew up on watching Wheel of Fortune and the price is right and uh, come on down, you know, like. Bob Barker type stuff. We can do this with with all this energy in the world. Like that's where it is. And it's just we gotta open our eyes to it. You know, it could literally be anything, you know. Uh they used to have these things called gas station attendants. I don't know if anybody remembers this, but like you would pull up to a gas station, there would be a person who walks out and be like, uh, how much gas would you like? And I wash your windows and like they weren't crackheads. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, because, you know, anyway, that used to be a thing. Gas station attendants, like people would come out and pump your gas and have a conversation with you because gas wasn't as expensive as it is today. So when you pay for a lot of gas, you actually have to sit at your car for a minute, you know, like 20 bucks worth of gas. You <laughs> there's a comedian that said, you know, used to be back in the day. 
I pump my gas. I put twenty dollars in gas. Like I got time to sit with my car, bond with my car. I can wash the windows, get rid of some trash. Now, trying to pay for twenty dollars worth of gas, I barely get finished putting the gas thing in the tank and clicking it on. It's like click. You're like, there's no way that was twenty bucks. It's like, yeah, you only ordered like three gallons of gas, so it's twenty bucks. You know, it's like, uh, it's a rip off. But anyway, all that being said. When you dance in a circle at the wedding, uh, the Jewish wedding, they're drawing down that light, that surrounding light. And it's really cool to think about bringing down light and the groups of people who are doing that, the energy and the excitement and the celebration. And it's intentional and it's super mystical. So it's awesome. Um, yeah. So all of that, I was going to talk about that. Jewish wisdom of the numbers, uh, and I wanted to bring this up because this caught my eye as I was looking um, at the number five, was talking about the uh, the central point that brings everything together, which is the letter hey. And I always think about like when we are doing the Shema, you actually bring the four corners together into your hand, and your hand represents the fifth point, and that is... Uh, about like how we're praying that Hashem will bring in the exiles from the four corners of the earth and that we want to bring them to the centralized place where Hashem has put his name. Hashem's name is four letters. There are four corners of the Talit and we're talking about the oneness of Hashem when we bring these four together and again with Gematria, the numerical values, not only can you count the numeric values of the letters, but you can add one, which is called the kolel, for the total word itself. There's also a practice where you can add the number of letters in the word with the numerical value of the word itself. You know, so you can actually call the name, the divine name of Hashem, not just 26, but 27 for like, counting it all as a whole, or there are four letters in the name of Hashem, and that would be 26 plus 4, so that would be 30. Turns out that's the same gematria as Yehuda, which is the king, and the king is like the king because he's the son of the king. You know, this is why the king comes from David, you know, who came from Yehuda, and David is called the son of God, and David's son will be also called the son of God, you know, all these kinds of things. So anyway... Um, all that being said, I was in five and looking at this five time, five time. It says, see Rumbum opening introduction to the five books of the Chumash for how Bereshit Genesis contains the creation narrative relates or uh, relates the lives of the Jewish forefathers and the creation of Israel. This is why Genesis can also be called um, Sefer uh Yesharim, the book of the upright, uh, because you have the, all the patriarchs in there and the the twelve tribes or the twelve sons of Yaakov who are also patriarchs. They're patriarchs of their tribes. And so the book of the upright is another name for Genesis. And then you have Shmot, which records the redemption of the Jewish people from their exile in Egypt to receive the Torah at Sinai, the building of the Mishkan, the sanctuary to house the Shekinah, which is the divine presence that would dwell in their midst. So what's interesting is Hashem says, I was with you even in exile. And if you think about how powerful this book is, it's saying like, remember when I was with you in exile, you're like, no. Because I thought I was by myself and I was crying out and you didn't do anything. And we were there for like 80 some years and it was supposed to be 430 years. Just going to overlook the fact that you cut that down and made that only 210 years, really. And only 86 of those years were really, really bad. But even though you did all that cutting down the exile stuff. Um, yeah, Hashem, where were you? Can't believe that you left us by ourselves. And he's like, no, I was with you. I was there. I saw it all. My Shekinah was with you. You know, I didn't leave you as orphans. You know, the bones of Yosef were in the Nile or wherever else they're said to be. And I also had Aharon. He was there holding everybody together. Miriam was also there. This is why it's called Miriam, the sister of Aharon. 
And then Moshe Rabbeinu, I sent him to come get you. And then I did all these wonders for you and all these kinds of things. Normally, I can't deal with Egypt because it's such an impure place. I couldn't even send angels to Egypt to start assisting and doing things. I had to come myself. And do you know, a Kohen is not allowed to go into a graveyard and Egypt was like into a graveyard and Hashem is like into a Kohen. I feel like Woody on uh, Toy Story 2. And he's like, what's that bullseye? Little Timmy fell into a well and then all the orphans are in trouble and there's a big uh, disaster about to happen and you need me to go save them right now? Well, ride like the wind, bullseye. Anyway. Um, so yeah, so Hashem did that. You know, and so Hashem descending into Egypt is a huge thing, but his presence was already there among us. Then we moved from that disposition by the end of the book to like cloud covering everything. All of us are on our faces and then Hashem calls out the Moshe Rabbeinu and Hashem is in our midst and we're free. That's a, that's a night and day difference. So that's Shmot. And then it says that uh, Vayikra, Leviticus, focuses upon the laws of the Kohenim. This is why the book of Leviticus is also called Torah Kohenim, the Torah of the priests, which is not only just the priests and the Levites, but also the children of Israel, because we're supposed to be priests to the world. The way the priests are to us is the way we're supposed to be to the nations. So it's like it's definitely the tiered hierarchy not a pyramid system, if you will, but like the way that we're being connected is the way we're called to connect other people, help people find their place, help people draw near to Hashem. They don't have to convert to Judaism. I hope we're all on that page now of understanding just in order for someone to be right with Hashem, that doesn't mean they have to convert. One of the things that uh, was shared uh, from Rabbi Gutierrez, may he live and be well, Many people live in these isolated places and they're reaching out and being like, I want to convert to Judaism. And his response has been like, it's not that I don't want to convert them and I don't think that they should convert and all that, but is the conversion more about a belief or is it about living in community? Because is there going to be a minyan? Are you actually going to come to shul, you know, or are you just going to stay in isolation Never, ever build a community and consider yourself Jewish hiding under a rock or out in the wilderness kind of thing. Judaism is meant to be lived in community, and it's not just about a belief. It's actually about a, live, a livelihood and among other people. It's super communal. The Torah wasn't given to an individual. It was given to a nation, you know, and so I thought that was really interesting because I never thought about it that way. And many people do want to convert these days, but do you want to be in a community? Because one of the things that is required to be a community is to be a minyan. If you don't have a minyan, you're considered to be a private community, like, like a family in a living room kind of thing. Like you're private. And this is why you don't do a lot of the different blessings, a lot of the extra prayers that you could do if you had a minyan. Also, when you're uh, benching or davening the Birkat Amazon, that we just call benching, you know, uh, if you have three or more men together, you can do the Zimun, the invitation, invite, you know, Hashem's glory into your, your presence, you know, but without that, if you're not eating with other people, Slika, you don't get to do that, so... You know, what is really the thing if you're not in community, you know, uh, coming together to to do the Hallel and the Lulav waving and the prayers of Yom Kippur and doing the Seder and having the Megillah reading, you know, the seven Aliyot when it's time on Shabbat. You don't got no people to do all those things, you know, and you're just like, yeah, but I want to be Jewish. It's just kind of like, OK, this is not just about making yourself like a proper, you know, person of uh, faith or belief or whatever. Judaism is not like that. It's not like a, a religious system of like, make yourself right with God and 
and do whatever you want. Like you, you're supposed to aim for community. This is why it should hurt that we don't live in an Eru, that we don't live in Israel, that we don't have the temple, you know, that we, we don't have our, our Mishpaka like next to us. Obviously, we want our space and we don't want to live all cooped up and things like that. But that's really how it works. You know, if you're so isolated all the time, how can you learn? You know, if you're only seeing people once a week, you know, and the rest of the time, I mean, I know time is going by fast. So once a week feels like every three days. But it's, I'm just saying, like, it's the daily in and out, like to be able to dive in multiple times a day together and, and to encourage and lift each other up. We have lots of questions. You know, one of the biggest things that was helpful for me uh, as I was in my early years of uh, observance is that I would have like from Arab Shabbat candle lighting practically all the way through Abdallah with like short naps <laughs> because I would only sleep for like a few hours because we'd be up so late and then I have to get up and go to shul and then from shul to Oneg to uh, after Oneg, Menka, Third Meal, uh, Habdala, and Motsi Shabbos, that was all packed with just learning, studying, conversating, getting to know people, people getting to know me. And like, yeah, it was a sacrifice. It is a sacrifice. Anytime you want to learn, anytime you want to study, you do have to sacrifice. This is the meaning of, uh, this is the Torah of a person who dies in their tent. Because you have to kill yourself in order to gain Torah. You have to sacrifice schedule, time, you know, experiences and things like that in order to learn, you know. Uh, and that's just the way it goes. And it's like, obviously, there needs to be a balance because the sages also say, don't inherit a double Gehenna. You don't want Gehenna in this world and then have to pass into the world of souls and then go through Gehenna again. You really don't want to do that. Because sometimes you could push yourself to the limit like that and be like, oh, my gosh, this life is just so terrible. I'm always doing this and I never get a chance to have my outlet. You know, some of these things I talked about with the the chefs and the the game shows and, you know, the scavenger hunts and, and living life. And, you know, you could be a kosher tour guide, you know, like show people the creations of the world and. You know, talk about like what's the significance of trees, the significance of water and rocks and, you know, the heavenlies, some place where people can breathe fresh air that doesn't consist of smog and traffic, you know, taking people out into the wilderness and being like, this is kind of like what it was like going out of Egypt, you know, those kinds of things. Like it's so important to be expressive. So anyway, all that being said is that that's that's the goal to to link people up and it's not necessarily that they need to be Jewish. You know, the Kohenim don't come at us being like, okay, so you're not a Kohen. So if I teach you this, you can be a Kohen and you should want to be a Kohen because, you know, you're not allowed to just be like, oh, yeah, I'm going to convert to be a Kohen. Like, or let me transition and transform into a Kohen. Like Pencus did. And it's just like, ah, oh, Pencus was Aaron, Aharon's grandson. While he merited to make his way into the Kohenim, uh, the Kehuna, but it, it's not like that's the way that we all are supposed to go. And actually doing Pencus type things are not encouraged, by the way. That was like, this is a one off situation. This is not something that needs to be the norm you know, for everybody to be doing. You don't need a, a million Pincuses running around going, I'm going to be zealous. I'm going to stab a Nazi. You know, and you're like, uh, yeah, we don't really want that to be the MO. We don't really want our Nazi being all brazen like Zimri. you like, we don't have time for that. So anyway, all that being said, that's what that's all about. I want to mention that it's really important for us to understand that you know, there is merit in conversion, but it's not required. And it's not saying that to be a cop out, but just saying the, the true dynamics to what it is. The uh, the guarding of the sanctuary and all of that is in living as in uh, is in by 
Bamidbar, Numbers, documents the travails in the wilderness and the relevant laws. Yeah, and the wilderness, just all the challenges. So that's really the book of like going through things where we failed, we triumphed, we failed, we triumphed. You know, we learned some relevant laws about how to deal with and handle that, you know, all those kinds of things. Then we have Devarim, Deuteronomy, also termed the Mishnah Torah. So Sefer Mishnah Torah is the book of Deuteronomy because it recounts and reiterates the Torah, which is like Mishnah, repeat. Uh, and then it's it says repetition of Torah that was said by Moshe to the generation about to enter the land. Because the pun on top of this is that when we get to the barim, it's a brand new generation that, you know, you basically got to go through all of the Torah for again. Like, their parents knew the Torah, but do they know the Torah? This is a really, really big thing in Judaism because we can train up our children and show them all the mitzvot and things like that, but they've got to own it. They've got to invest in it. They've got to learn it. This is another big reason why having a new sock and a tradition is so important so you can hand these things over and give them the resources to seek it out. Because many times people do things and they don't know why they do it. They don't have the tools or the ability to go and study and see why do we actually do this? Do, is this something I want to do? Why should I do the same thing my parents did? You know, for those of us who converted, we're not doing the things our parents did, you know, which is like crazy. And, and it has to be such a shock where it's just like, I can't believe I raised my children and they're all the way over here and they're doing this, you know? And I'm like, I get it, Emma's and Oppa's. Oh my gosh. Like, could you imagine your children going, yeah, I don't want the Torah. Give me this Quran or give me this, you know, uh, ancient Eastern wisdom stuff. You know, that would have to be very anguishing especially when you spend a lot of time for if you're raising boys, making sure that they have their Brit Malah, making sure that they do bar mitzvah, you know, and, and things like that. And you're just kind of like, I bought you to fill in and you're not using them. You know, like, ah, that's hard. That's tough. But you do have to give them something and step back and give them their space because they've got to own it. And that's interesting that Devarim teaches that. And I don't know, it just caught my eye because I never really look at the Torah as like these stages and these levels. And what's interesting is we were talking about the world before, how they're all inside each other. Well, there's actually five worlds. There's a higher world than Atzilut. It's called Adam Kadmon. And it's super mystical. Don't really know much about it to be able to teach it. But just to tell you, there are five worlds. There are five levels of Torah from the simple and it's what's known as the Sod of Sod. Like, you really get up there. And that's represented by Kabbalah and Hasidut. That's beyond the mystical level of Torah, known as Sod. So you got your five books, your five worlds, and you got your five levels of Torah. So there you go. And then the five books of Torah, in addition to revealing himself through creation. So that's one level. Hashem says, I'm going to reveal myself. And here's creation. This is why Hashem being clothed in nature and us understanding that is so important. How to be able to look at the sky, look at the stars, look at the creations and be able to say, Hashem, I see you. You know, and that's the meaning of Hashem being masked is that we uh, we can see him behind the mask. And that's how you get into the uh, the interplay between the miracles and the normal nature miraculous happenings like the fact of Hashem can give you all kinds of money but you go to work and make a paycheck and sometimes you may think I don't know how to balance my budget how to make this all work out but you put forth the effort and work and then all of a sudden you get your paycheck Something over here drops off somebody gives you an extra check over here you get a gift card all these kinds of things but you were just focused on trying to work. You're working in the natural and Hashem brings in the miracles. Like that's the way it is. So this is one of the really cool things where you just go give yourself to Hashem. 
and then he reveals himself. It says God reveals his will through the Torah, parallel to the word of God in the world creation, which begins with the fifth letter. The Torah as the word of God similarly is connected to the number five in the Humash, the five books of Torah. I feel like that was very uncohesive. So parallel to the word of God in the world's creation, which begins with the fifth letter, the Torah as the word of God similarly is connected to the number five in the Kumash. That's going to need some sitting down and thinking about, at least for me. Maybe you get it. And that's awesome. Please teach the rest of us. The five books of Torah are Bereshit, uh, which is Genesis, Shemot, Exodus, Vayikra, Leviticus, Numbers, um, Bami Bars, Numbers, Devarim, Deuteronomy. There is a unique underlying common motive that runs through each of these books. Together they are inscribed in, onto a Torah scroll. This serves as the basis for Jewish life as the essential foundation of Torah Shev Ketav, the written Torah. I'm going to skip down a little bit here. Well, I got to say this. Everything is contained within the five books of the Humash, at which is the cornerstone of Jewish life and Torah study. The five books of Torah were given over to the Jewish people. Of God's many creatures, man is the most beloved. Of all the nations in the world, the Jewish people is the most beloved. The Midrash lists five biblical expressions of love. The title, B'nai Yisrael, children of Israel, is mentioned five times in the Torah in one verse. I did not bookmark that verse, but I have the book over here just to say it for the posterity of the recording. Of the court. Number five, number five, footnote 40. Footnote 40, what you got? What you got on my 40? Okay. Um, Bami Bar 8, numbers 8, verses 18 through 19. It mentions the children of Israel five times there. This reflects that their beloved or this reflects their beloved status while the highest of the four primary forms of creation is that of Medaber, which is articulate man. There is an additional more sublime fifth level, that of Israel. Wow. So, the articulate man, but then the higher level is Israel. In the spiritual hierarchy, the classification of elite man is reserved for the chosen nation entrusted with the fulfillment of the five books of Torah. So, like, there is man, and then there is articulate man. Now, my video looks frozen. I'm not sure what's going on. Switching cameras, I guess. Can we do that? There we go. That probably looks really poor quality, but I don't know what's going on with my camera, so I'm just going to keep it there. Okay, so not that you really need to see my camera because it's all about the screen right now. We talked about respecting God in speech last week, and here it is that... Uh, from the Handbook of Jewish Thought, here's your section. There we go. Blow it up. Boom. Okay. So this is chapter eight. It is permissible to pronounce a word that is identical to a divine name as long as its connotation implies a secular meaning. For example, it's permissible to pronounce the word Elohim when it is an obvious reference to human judges or false gods, or Zevaot when it refers to armies. Because in modern Hebrew, a lot of these words you could hear and you could be like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you're saying divine names. It's like, I'm not talking about Hashem. 
Same thing, hallelujah, is a composite word meaning praise God. Should not be used except in prayer. Since the last syllable is a divine name. At other times, it is customary to pronounce it Alleluia. So Elohim, Hashem, Hakadosh Baruch Hu, uh, Adonai, or um, Kel, you know, all those. And these are some kind of uh, bullet points and takeaways. But when a divine name is part of another proper name, it is no longer sacred since its translation is. Since it is not translated separately, for example, one may always pronounce such names as Yermiyahu, Hezkiyahu, Zachariah, because it says the final syllable is the divine name, Yah, which you would actually say Ka, if that was the case. But we don't ever say Yermiyahu, you know, or Hezkiyahu, or Zachariahu, or Zachariah. Like, we don't ever say that. So, um, this is true even when the divine name appears as a separate word, such as Beit El, since it is still translated as part of the proper name. So, proper names, you're good. Then it says it's permitted to pronounce divine names when reading biblical verses, even if only part of the verse is quoted. Therefore, when one comes across a biblical connotation in it, Quotation is study. It may be read as written, even if it contains God's proper name. Teaching your children to read or say their blessings, it is permissible to pronounce God's name wherever necessary. Because you really want to give it over and teach them how to say, how to pronounce it, how to say it. Um, greatest respect for his name in any language. It is therefore customary not to pronounce God's name in any language except in prayer or study, or when proclaiming his deeds, it is disrespectful to use God's name as part of a curse. You know, and uh, oh, how we see these words a lot. The top left of the screen. Yeah. Some people say, for Pete's sake, you know. I just like to say, oh, fish sticks or something of the like. My favorite, for some reason, has become a uh, biscuit eater. I don't know. They're just like, what a biscuit eater, you know, or something like that. It's just, I don't know. Oh, my all-time favorite, cotton-headed ninny monkey. Oh, my gosh. that That right there. Like, if I can really get worked up, that's my go-to. That is my go-to. Be like, cotton-headed ninny monkey, you ninny. You know what I mean? <laughs> anyway, there are so many fun words. Why you got to be all cursy with it, you know? One of the things is is doing this music thing. There's a lot of people who curse, and I'm kind of like, I don't, I don't get down with that. But, I mean, I understand. I, you got to express yourself. That's fine. Some people cuss and they do the things and I'm like, uh, while, while you cuss, I don't cuss and I'm not going to have that as a judgment thing. But, you know, I guess there's a fine line because I want to provide an atmosphere, uh, at least when I do things where you can expect to come to a place where you're not going to get F-bombed and all those kinds of things. And it's just like I, finding content for that that's outside of myself uh is very very hard it's slim you know because even if you have the cleanest things there's sometimes they just drop in words and you're just kind of like did you have to you know sometimes i just want to go in and edit you know it's like i can rap let me rap your verse for you real quick can i be your radio version please because i love your song you know i don't really want to do that but there are many music songs out there i don't I don't really have to go crazy like that. But anyway, it's just my own thing. The Shem Hamiforash. I really want everybody to know about this. Ham Forash or Hame Forash. This is the Tetragrammaton. God himself is absolutely unknowable and unnameable. The Tetragrammaton is his highest emanation in creation. 
One who pronounces the Tetragrammaton disrespectfully is worthy of death and has no portion in the world to come. According to tradition, whenever the Tetragrammaton is written, the four letters, it is read, I don't not. However, when it occurs in conjunction with the name Adonai, it is read as Elohim. When I was reading the Haftar portion, this is always tough for me because it's like, thus says Hashem Elohim. You know, and I'm like, uh, you know, but it says the name like twice in the text. So you have to like flip your brain to be able to say it because that's not the way it's actually read. But you actually pronounce it Hashem Elohim. So that's where that comes in. Tetragrammaton is never pronounced as written. Or sleek out. The only place where the tetragram tetragrammaton or Shem Hamfarash was ever pronounced as written was in the temple. And it talks about this, it gives the verses. It was pronounced daily in the priestly blessing. Yevarekaka Hashem the Yishmereka. You hear you would hear that name during that prayer. That had to be so powerful. Uh ten times during Yom HaKippurim. Daily priestly blessing, the tetragrammaton was vocalized with the vowel points associated with the name Adonai. So this is the thing that I was talking about, like when you put when you see sometimes the vowel points of the divine name. As this is right here, this would kind of tell you how to pronounce Adol Nine because the Yud is replaced with an Olive. Uh, okay, yeah, that <laughs> did teleported by itself. I did not mean to do that, but you can see the the Yud, the Olive, the Hey gets changed for the Dalit, the Vav for the Noon. The hay for the you. So really inside of this name is actually this name. So while we're here, transliterations of this, the colloquial way to say it, Hashem. Even the Aleph Dalit name is Hashem. The Yod and Hey, we say Ka. That's the Tetragrammaton, God Eternal, God Lord. Um, some more should be here. There we go. Elohim, Elohim, Eloha is Eloka, Elohe, Eloke, El Kel, Eye, Ech, Ye, Shaddai is Shakai, Zevaot, Zevakot. So those are some ways to safeguard the name of Hashem. So I wanted to share a little bit of the laws of Kriyat Torah that I'm slowly working my way through. Slowly, but for surely, um, still in the chapter about who's obligated in reading, it says an individual versus congregation. It is debated amongst the post scheme if Kriyata Torah is an obligation upon the congregation or is a personal obligation upon each of an individual. Some post scheme rule it is an obligation upon each individual to hear the Torah. However, majority of post king rule that it is a general obligation upon the congregation and not upon the individual. According to this latter approach, one who missed the Torah reading of his minyan, and certainly if he only missed a few words, is not obligated to make it up by another minyan. Likewise, according to the latter approach, one may live in a city that does not have a minion. Talk about isolation, right? Even though he will miss Kriyata Torah, practically, however, even according to the latter approach, every man is initially required to place effort to be present by the Torah reading and create a community minion. We should create effort. Okay, we should place an effort on it. But if we don't have one, it's not the end of the world. It says, similar to the obligation one has to make a minyan for davening. Likewise, every man who is present by the minyan is obligated to hear every single word of the reading. Then there's the reading versus the blessings. There is no obligation on the congregation to be yotze. Okay, so this is another word I want to share with us. 
if you ever come across this word, it means the one who carries it out. So your obligation to actually carry out the mitzvah is called yotze ha mitzvah, like to be the person who actually carries out the mitzvah. It's actually from the word uh, yetziyat mitzrayim, like the exodus from Egypt. So literally when you carry out a commandment, you're like doing an exodus, which I thought was pretty cool to play on words there. So to exodus the blessings, you know, carry them out, uh, get them out of bondage, said by the aliyot of Kriyat Torah, and the obligation is merely regarding the hearing of the Torah. So there's no obligation on the congregation to do the blessing, but the obligation is on them to hear, which is why the congregation doesn't have to do the bracha before reading the Torah. But we want to make sure that we can hear it, which kind of plays in a little bit as far as an aspect, maybe not in totality, that if you don't have a minyan, you don't recite the bracha, but you can still read from the Torah scroll. Because that's the obligation is to hear the Torah being read, but not necessarily to have to do the blessings. And then it goes on to say that nonetheless, it is an obligation upon the congregation to pay attention to the blessing while it's been said. While you may not have to say the blessing as a congregation, definitely got to pay attention to it. Can't just be all zoned out while we're brockling, doing brockless. Women. Are women obligated? Some post king rule that women are obligated in hearing Kriyat the Torah. Other post king, however, rule that women are not obligated in hearing Kriyat, Kriyat Torah. Practically, by the way, Kriyat Torah is the, the call of the Torah, the hearing of the Torah, and uh, the reading of the Torah. So that's that. Practically, the widespread custom is for woman not to be particular to hear Kriyat Torah. We also talk about Kriyat Shema, right? Like the recitation of the Shema. And it says, thus they are permitted to leave shul for Kriyat Torah or not come to shul at all. And it's not really something women have to get all worked up about as far as being at shul. This is kind of interesting because it's like the women aren't necessarily obligated in it, but the, it is praiseworthy to be a part of it. Nevertheless, a woman who remains in shul is to concentrate on the reading and not talk or disturb. However, if she has not yet davened and fears missing zaman to fila, then she is to daven quietly during Kriyat, Kriyat Torah. Women who are within their period of menstruation are not to look at the separate Torah. So look at that footnote, because that's intense. Admore 88.2, something 88.2, Rashad Benyamin Zed. That's kind of interesting because, you know, you kind of feel like if a woman is going through Nida, she shouldn't, like, Touch the score, touch the Torah, whatever, make Aliyah, but it's like not to look at it, which, which is just interesting. But that's a custom and a practice. It not necessarily mean don't look at the Torah scroll if you're in Nida, but like that's a thing. And then it says, what receives precedence? Hearing Kriyata Torah or davening with a minion or on time? If one is unable to both daven with a minyan and hear Kriyat Torah, then he is to proceed davening with a minyan. Certainly, one is to proceed davening with Zaman Tefillah, then to hear Kriyat Torah and pushing off davening until after Zaman Tefillah. So it's really important to uh to daven as opposed to just hear the Torah. Last part, we are here. Full class tonight. Oh my goodness. Golden calf, man. Golden calf. So we receive crowns. So there's an encyclopedia. Yes, I know it says math or math. It says myth, <laughs> magic, and mysticism. We literally call this the MMA. 
book, the JMMA, because it's uh, it's pretty violent. It's like a cage fight every time you read it, and it's it's out there. It's a little mystical, but there are sources. It brings down sources. See, Shabbat eighty-eight. Sleek out Exodus four. Tosa four. Rosh Hashanah twenty-three. A. It tells you where it gets it from. It's just it's Hakelot literature. It's just far out. Sometimes it's, it's it's a little intense, but that's okay. One of the things that we need to be ready for, for the Messianic era, is a, a cosmic shift. You know, like reality as we know it to change. You know, um, the way people are doing sound bowls and meditating, and, uh, hyperbaric chambers, and, uh, intravenous therapies, you know, ozone therapy, I guess is what it's called, better yet. Uh, essential oils, frequencies and vibrations, teleporting, space travel, and portals. We got to get ready for all those things. That's going to become a part of our normal everyday living. The way that it was put by uh, a Chabadnik is that the parting of the sea will be like a rainy day. So the way we experience, oh, I guess it's going to rain today. Okay, here we go. Rainy day. Leave earlier so I don't have to deal with traffic craziness. Or I'm going to be dealing with traffic craziness, so leave earlier. And the way we just know, okay, well, it's a rainy day. Cool. All right. Well, that's what the miracles are going to be like. It's just going to be wide open, revealed. Again, I talk about the sleepers who are going to awake from the dust. Like, that's going to be crazy. That's going to be considered as, as as normal as when it rains outside. So we just got to get ready for that level of shift. Again, that mixed gas diving we were talking about, getting acclimated enough so that you can come back to the surface safely. That's what this exile is pulling out of us. So when you're hearing conspiracy theories, and hoaxes, and things like that, these things are literally getting you ready for the real deal because you're not supposed to know what is exactly the truth or not. We live in the mix of everything. Everything's mixed. You know, things are not as they should seem and places are not really what they pretend to be or portray to be. And it's like, who's right? Who's on first? Like, that's why that skit is so classic because it's literally who's on first, what's on second. You know, and all of that. So I keep looking up here, but I got to look here now. Okay. Hello, everyone. Okay. Crowns. So we said, not saving Ishma. Hashem sent down a whole bunch of angels, and we got draped, draped up, and dripped out. Know what I'm talking about. If you get draped up, that means you get accessorized, you get blinged out. And we got blinged out. And when we made the golden calf, all of that stuff, Hashem sent twice as many angels to take all that stuff from us. Depending on who you ask, it was weapons. It was jewelry. It was the divine name. It was crowns that got taken from us. So what really was it? So let's just look at crowns for a minute. It says crown, which is keter. This is a really cool insight. So Keter starts with the letter Kaf. There's an insight on the letter Kaf that says it's called 10 and 10, which is the Torah. There were 10 utterances and to create. And then those correspond to the 10 utterances of the giving of the Torah. When Hashem gave the Torah, he used 620 letters. 620 letters? I gotta double check this. 620 letters. Pocket computer, what you got? Of course, I didn't put this in the notes. Should have put this in the notes. I think it's 620 letters. If you look at the uh, the whole passage of the giving of the Torah, yeah, it's 620 letters. And it says that, um, oh, let me see if I can do this. This is something fancy. Does this work if I do it? 
Let's try this. Let's see what happens. But this would be so cool if this works. Boy, if this shows up. Oh my God. <laughs> it's so awesome. Okay, this is what I was thinking about. I'm trying to I was trying to give it over by memory, but I don't have to anymore. This is right here. So if you take the word 20, which is cough, okay, cough equals 20. The word for cough is S ream, which is 20. It add up its letters, you arrive at 620. So Ain, Shin, Raish, Yu, Mim equals the Gematria 620. There that is right there. 620 is the Gematria of Keter. And then you have, it reminds us of the 620 letters in the Ten Commandments. So when Hashem spoke, I know key, and then all the way through the Ten Commandments, Ten Statements, 620 letters. Then it says, God crowned the Jewish people by giving them the Torah, it became the Jews' raison de etreto, following the 613 commandments and the seven rabbinic laws, or sometimes the seven Noahide laws, which together equals 620. Sig significantly, the first letter of Keter is Kaf. Now, Gematria of Kaf is 20, can be divided into 10 and 10. The first 10 represents 10 utterances with which God created the world. The second 10 represents the 10 commandments. Together, they became a kaf. And then number seven, uh, verse 86, it says, 10, 10 is the kaf. Literally, weighing 10 shekels apiece. So there is that, about 620 in the crown. So Keter, also Koteret or Atara, crowns are a symbol of authority and power. There are four crowns in the Jewish tradition. The crown of royalty, crown of the priesthood, crown of the Torah, and the crown of a good reputation. A vote 417. Both the king and the high priest wore types of crowns. This is one of the things I was thinking about mentioning on Shabbat is that um, there's really like two kingly stature type people. They have the king in all of his array, but then you have the Kohen Gadol who looks like a king because he's wearing a crown and he's doing all this kind of stuff. And there is a story about Alexander when he met the Kohen that he bowed before him. So a king bowed to the king looking person. So the king and the high priest do that. In some communities, brides and grooms are crowned at the wedding. The only fabulous crowns mentioned in the Agata are the 1,200,000 crowns placed on the heads of Israel. Two for each male. God assumed they would share with the women. By angels at Mount Sinai, those crowns were taken back by God after the golden calf incident. Skip down a little bit here. And some later mystical thought, the calf became synonymous with the dangers of mystical speculation. According to this interpretation, the Israelites witnessed the same divine chariot described by Ezekiel, but misinterpreted the angelic oxen face to be that of God, thus inspiring them to build the golden calf. So they, we saw the same thing Ezekiel saw, which is really Hashem's manifestation or Hashem's glorious revelation uh, out of nowhere. And then... Uh, well, we know it came from somewhere. But we saw the ox and we were like, oh, look at that. Like that was the standout thing of the vision. So we created one and tried to, you know, appropriate that into our own worship and praise. 
And so uh, seeing the ox, we decided let's just make, you know, the golden calf, which would serve as the divine chariot of Hashem, even though it's just the ox. But that was based off of our perception. So really, we're talking about idolatry being based off of our perception. You know, like where a person is and what they can perceive, that's what their uh, power sources really looked at is coming from. So our idolatry is more about our perception as opposed to it being a true reality. So top 47A talks about Gehazi. And it says, what did Gehazi do to cause others to sin? Some say he hung a magnet for the sin of Yerevon. So Yerevon put two golden calves at the... Um, the exit of the northern kingdom into the southern kingdom because he did not want people making aliyah for the pilgrimage and he wanted to follow his own calendar set up his own mountain where people could make aliyah and go up and worship the shim so gehazi came in on top of this and was like oh let me take this to another level put a magnet on there and suspended the calf between heaven and earth and the people creating the impression that it had supernatural powers. As a result, it would declare, I am, I don't know your God, uh, etc. You shall you shall not recognize the gods of others in my presence. And yet some say that Gehazi drove the rabbis away from Eliyahu or Eli, Elisha's presence. So what's interesting is the golden calf in Parshakti Tisa like moved around, it flew, we gave it manna so it could eat, all those kinds of things. And then when Yaravon made the calves, Gehazi decided, let me come by and animate them. And the way he chose to animate them was to use something with magnets and like suspend them up in the air between the heavens and the earth. So uh, I will put a pin in it right there. That's the end of our notes and stop share. And I will go to our calendar before we head out. Uh, that we are in the last uh, couple of weeks of the first Adar. So we got a little bit of time. Uh, we have Parsha Shekelim coming up. And so that'll be the first of four special Shabbats. So we'll be getting ready for that. That's the announcing of the half shekels. Uh, but yeah, otherwise, pretty straightforward week. Um, the Torah portions of Bayakel and Pekude are broken up this year because we have a leap year. So um, basically, just be aware of that as that's coming up. Like a lot of the Torah portions we read together, we're going to break them up and read them separately. So a lot more time to engage with them and to uh, like reflect. So there we go. That is our class for the week, everyone. Cold two. Again, as always, if you have questions, you would like to talk or discuss more, please do. You got my number. Uh, and by that, I mean, you know uh, how to reach me on Signal and Facebook and like Telegram and whatnot. You also have my email address. So if you need anything, holla at me for real. I'm serious. Uh, I do my best to get to everybody if you need it. And uh, I can point you in all sorts of directions. And there's so many sources that we can really discuss and talk about. So Baruch Hashem for that. Again, I keep looking up here at the camera. The camera's right here. Sorry. So anyway, um, may have a great week. Have fun studying Parshaki Tisa, and let's bring some tikkun, and uh, let's see Mashiach soon. Cold tube, everyone.